students and uh, distinguished uh, faculty members attending this summer school. It's given me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alok Bharadwaj. Uh, Dr. Alok Bharadwaj completed uh, his B.Tech in Civil Engineering from G.B. Pant University of Agriculture and Technology in 2011. Obtained his M.Tech from IIT Bombay in 2013 and Ph.D. from National University of uh, Singapore uh, in 2018. Dr. Bharadwaj worked as postdoctoral fellow at the Earth Observatory of uh, Singapore, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Currently, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and joint faculty at the Center of Artificial Intelligence and Data Sciences at IIT Roorkee. Dr. Bharadwaj is a National Geographic Explorer and is supported by National Geographic Society to conduct flood research in Asia. Dr. Bharadwaj's main research interest includes application of remote sensing and deep learning techniques to study the urban floods and rain-induced landslides, understanding the link between climate and teleconnections and occurrence of extreme rainfall events and ensuing flood in Asia. So with this a brief introduction, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Alok Bharadwaj to deliver a, uh, uh, a hands-on. So over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramesh, and also thank you, uh, Dr. Shyam, for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, summer school, uh, which is organized by IEEE, GRSS, and NIT Surat Film. And I'm very delighted that uh, I am also a part of this school. So uh, good morning to everyone again. So my name is Alu. So I am a faculty at civil engineering at IIT Roorkee. And what you see here is the our, one of the main buildings. Uh, the, we call it as a main building. Uh, so it is the central administrative building of the institute. And uh, today I will be uh, speaking about uh, the application of artificial intelligence uh, for disaster response. Uh, I am sure that many of the people in the audience must be aware that India is prone to many kinds of disasters uh, that are caused by hazards, for example, floods, landslides, earthquakes, uh, and wildfires also. And recently, the COVID uh, that has affected the whole country. So this uh, presentation uh, is more about uh, giving you an introduction to what kind of disasters are happening in India and uh, uh, how AI can help in the response uh, activities to such disasters. Before I begin, uh, it is important to understand that what is a disaster? So United Nations uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters. So according to UNDRR and uh, CRED, Disaster refers to a serious disruption of society by unforeseen and often sudden situation or event which exceeds local capacity to cope with using its own resources. So in, in a general sense, the disaster affects our society, uh, which is by some uh, shocking or surprise events. And usually uh, when the disaster hits a society, it is uh, not within the capacity of the local government or local people because uh, of such a destruction to human life as well as resources. So in India, you must have heard that there are droughts, earthquakes, storm, uh, floods, landslides and wildfires are happening uh, every year in different parts of the country. And recently the COVID-19 that has affected the many different parts almost the whole, whole, whole of our country. So as I was uh, having my breakfast today, I saw on the news that uh, in Himachal Pradesh, uh, there has been massive landslides and floods on the highway that is connecting Kangra. That is one of the cities in the Himachal Pradesh. And if you look in the, uh, in the news, the situation is really grave and a lot of people are still missing. So this also uh, brings back our attention to the disasters and how can these new tools, these 
uh, new data analytics can help us to understand more about these disasters, which is really the need of the art. So before uh, we begin to understand how the AI uh, can be used for disaster response, there are, uh, we first need to also get into a little bit of detail about disaster management. So disaster management is broadly being divided into four parts. It is mitigation, uh, preparedness, which happens before a disaster, which is um, on, on managing of the disaster before a disaster strikes. Uh, response, which is during a disaster, and recovery, which is after a disaster. So mitigation and preparedness, which happens before a disaster, usually entails, uh, for example, you buy insurance policies or you train uh, some response personals, or maybe you train some citizens uh, in the towns or in the villages that are exposed to hazards that how they can respond if a disaster strikes. You stock a lot of disaster supply kits, for example, first aid kits, tents, water bottles. Okay. Um, you implement uh, the advanced building codes and you build these buildings up to, up to the standards. So all of these preparations happen before a disaster strikes. When a disaster strikes, which uh, is when we call it as a disaster response. So uh, as I was saying uh, that a disaster is something that affects our society and it is uh, far exceeds the local capacity of the society to, uh, to cope with uh, when a disaster strikes. And I was giving an example of a very recent disaster that happened this late late night and this morning, which is in Himachal Pradesh, where a lot of landslides have, has happened and a lot of destruction to, this, to, to the economy and to the infrastructure has happened in that part. And I was speaking about the different components of the disaster management that uh, mitigation and preparedness happens before a disaster. During a disaster, you... Uh, 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 work with disaster response and then uh, after disaster the recovery happens so i already discussed that before a disaster you need what you need to do to to prepare yourself if a disaster strikes uh, during a disaster which is also called as the disaster response uh, the search and the rescue operations are undertaken to identify the people that are being affected to identify to uh, evacuate the people from the affected areas and there is some assessment of the initial damage that happens. So uh, usually it is a, it, uh, in the disaster uh, management terminologies, we call it as a rapid assessment, that you rapidly assess where the damage has happened. And a lot of work and a lot of innovation is in, in, in today's time is undertaking of, on how rapidly you can respond to a disaster using the remote sensing uh, sensors. Uh, uh, and the and the thing about uh, the disaster response is how do you provide first aid and humanitarian assistance to the affected people? And finally, after a disaster, when the disaster has strike, it has ended. Uh, you need to remove the debris from the area that is affected by the disaster. For example, if a flood happens, a flood carries a lot of sediment. If the houses are next to the banks, those sediments. Uh, moves into the houses, it fills those houses with those sediments and with the debris. So you, it is about removal of the, those debris. It is about precise assessment of the damage. For example, an earthquake happens where the buildings are being damaged. A certain building might look okay from the outside, but inside the different elements of the building must, must have been damaged. So it is equally important to understand that where the damage has happened. And finally, it is about the redevelopment of the community and restoring the livelihoods of the people, giving them the financial aid. So disaster management is a very uh, broad, uh, 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 a broad term that includes uh, these different subparts. And today we will uh, mostly focus on the disaster response part. So this mitigation and uh, preparedness, which happens before a disaster, are used for predictive assessments because you are predicting that when the disaster will affect and how you will cope with those disasters. Whereas uh, during a disaster and after a disaster, those are mostly descriptive assessments that you can describe that, okay, you know that where the disaster has happened, so you need to identify 
where the damage has happened so among all of these things the disaster response is where mostly the remote sensing uh, people i would say or the people with the remote sensing background usually work uh, uh, to assess the level of the damage which is in the disaster response okay so a lot of uh, ai application of ai has already been done for the disaster management so this slide uh, uh, this slide uh, basically tells you that there are different kinds of machine and deep learning methods that are out there and i will not go into the detail because i am sure definitely that by this time uh, all of these things must have been covered in the summer school so there are supervised models unsupervised models there are then deep learning models reinforcement learning is there optimization methods are there and all of these methods uh, all of these uh, different methods within these categories have already been applied for the different phases of the disaster management be it the mitigation preparedness uh, response or the uh, recovery so in particularly for the disaster and in every phase of the disaster management in itself is a big uh, uh, is a big work or i would say it's all together it's a different uh thing to be get to get studied but today uh because i can only cover a, a few part of this so i will only focus on the disaster response so you can see that in the disaster response you have this event mapping damage assessment uh disaster rescue and relief how do you allocate the resources right how do you use a disaster information system and how do you collaborate between the different agencies when a disaster strikes right so all of these and the different supervised unsupervised models deep learning models they have already been applied by many different authors to understand these different aspects of the disaster response so essentially uh, that the what whatever the ai uh, application of ai we will look in the disaster response they will revolve around these uh, four or five things that disaster response is for searching of the affected people or planning of the rescue operations or mapping of the event where the event has happened uh, resource allocation or the assessment of the damage so the disaster response application of remote sensing to disaster response and the application of ai to the disaster response revolves around these points okay so before uh, 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 we uh, we understand that how ai is used for disaster response it is it, it is important what are what are the different kinds of data sources that are available available for these disasters for example in situ sensors or iot that is there you can plug these sensors if uh, to measure the amount of the level in the water or the amount of the slope instability uh, uh, where the landslides are happening you can get the, the the data from these in situ sensors there are simulated data sets whenever uh, because the disasters do not happen every day they happen after a certain period of time so you have limited amount of data sets but to run these big ai models with so many parameters you need to fit those parameters you need simulated data sets so that you can feed that much amount of data sets so that uh, you can run these ai models then of course you have these uh, uav images optical radar satellite images that are there and you can apply these uh, image processing tools segmentation uh, morphology operations all of these different kinds of uh, operations on these uav and optical radar satellite images to extract the information you need also there is a social media news report for example twitter facebook and now uh, uh, you have got instagram so these all these gives you these images how do you use those images to respond to certain uh, disasters is all to in all together is a different research field we will only touch a little a little bit about that in today's presentation uh, historical data sets or we call it as a paleo data sets for example you go out into the field you you dig the hole uh, you get, collect the samples you date those samples you find out that where uh, that how the floods or maybe the flood disaster in particularly has happened in an area so historical data sets are equally important and finally the remote sensing derived products for example ndvi ndwi 
DEM, slope, uh, uh, drainage networks, all of these products that are derived from the remote sensing images are equally important to understand about disasters and responding to the disasters. So uh, a question uh, arises that why, do, why is there even a need to study the disaster response? Because uh, uh, the a simple uh, answer to this is because AI is able to, is it in itself is a complex uh, architecture and it is able to handle uh, the, the problems that are complex in nature. By complex in nature, it means that you do not know the features. You do not know how do you define the features that are important to study a disaster. You just have a plethora of the data set at your disposal. But how do you use that, uh, that amount of the data is what can be figured out by AI. So for example here, so this gives you uh, a map of uh, Uttarakhand. So there is, this is where I am based. And if you remember in 2013, there was a huge flood that, uh, sorry. So there was a huge flood, if you can see my pointer, that happened around the Kedarnath area. And this is uh, the, on the right side, this is the catchment, the outer catchment boundary of the Kedarnath area. And it shows the amount of the rainfall that is, uh, that happened for two days, uh, a very extreme rainfall event happened that caused this, uh, uh, a big flood and landslide event in Kedarnath. So you can see it, rainfall is one of the factors uh, uh, that can cause a disaster. But not only rainfall, there are many different factors that can cause uh, uh, or enhance a disaster. For example, how many, uh, how, what is the quantity of the boulders that are there in, in, in the channel? Uh, what is the size and the shape of these boulders? What is the morphometry of this, uh, uh, of this river channel, right? And, uh, uh, what are the slope? How how the, the 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 water that moves from upstream to downstream? What is the elevation change? What is the relief change in that area? So a lot of factors are interplaying with each other to cause a disaster. It so you have access to a lot of data sets that is associated with those factors, but you do not know that which of those factors are important for you. Of course, uh, the. Uh, the knowledge of the expert is critical here to select uh, those uh, factors. But even then, when such a complex event is happening, the expert also uh, uh, is, uh, is not able to determine that which one are the important factors. So you need to take everything into account to understand that how a disaster is, uh, is happening. Okay. So that is why it is, it, is, it is important to understand disasters using AI and to respond to disasters. So this is uh, another example of, uh, of, of, a flood, of a typhoon, Hajibis, that happened in Japan. So uh, here you can see that uh, uh, the authors have prepared an FPM, which is uh, also called as the flood proxy map of the area covering Tokyo and the different cities in Japan. So you can see these blue pixels are here, right? So these blue pixels tells you that where the flood has happened. But uh, sometimes this is more of a manual work because it is based on, uh, on some thresholding, some statistical inputs, which is not uniform from area to area. So sometimes it becomes a little difficult to understand that how do you arrive at such a flood map? Okay. The other is is also a, a, a DPM, which can which is also called as a damage proxy map of the for the same uh, typhoon Hajibis that happened here, and it is showing the damage that happened in the Tokyo prefecture. And you can see that these pixels are changing from yellow to red, showing the kind of the damage that has happened here. Again, uh, a lot of uh, manual interpretation goes into this uh, that where. Uh, we, like what pixels can be considered red and what pixels can be considered as yellow. And it also it is not uniform from area to area. So to make such studies uniform, to make such studies automated in nature, you need the help of uh, these tools and these numerical tools such as AI to understand that how these damages are happening in different areas and can there be either a region specific or a look or maybe a nation specific kind of an uh, AI system that can help you to identify or to, to, 
to develop such uh, such maps that shows that the level of the damage right so uh, under now uh, understanding that there are different uh, 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 parts to the disaster management and why uh, each disaster in it itself is a complex problem and for that uh, many times you need ai that because you have a lot of data sets for each of the factors that are contributing to to those disasters uh, you can uh, and how do we use and so why why there is a motivation to use the ai uh to to understand the disaster response but overall there are these different kinds of disasters uh that uh, uh, can broadly be divided for example there are earthquakes uh, storm is there volcanic activity flood uh, landslides and uh, wildfire so today we will only look a few of these disasters and how ai can be used for the disaster response for uh, a few of these disasters so this is a rather boring slide but i i want uh, uh, this to i want it to be uh, to read it to you that uh, because it's important that earthquake prediction is often considered as the grail of seismology which in a general sense refers to the prediction of the earthquakes considered as point sources so for the understanding earthquakes we are predicting the earthquakes at point sources which we also call as the seismicity uh and the one that is shown in purple it basically this paragraph basically says that uh, uh it is not always the case that ai which is a complex uh, method in itself it is the solution is always the solution so as i was saying that uh, for this ai for earthquake response uh uh so the earthquake prediction is often considered as the grail of seismology which in a general sense refers to the prediction of the earthquakes are uh, considered as point sources uh but uh, before uh, we understand that ai can be used for earthquake response uh many of the authors have identified that uh, uh, uh using ai may not be the case for uh, earthquake prediction uh because uh, sometimes simpler models such as logistic regression or even an uh, artificial neural network with only one neuron can be used for the prediction of the earthquakes with similar performance okay and we will see the reason for that uh, later so uh the whole pipeline for the ai for earthquake response uh, and it is also true for the other uh in any problem that you apply ai is the input data that you have so for example for ai so uh, the input data to uh, to understand an earthquake response is uh, for example seismicity indicators that could be there uh, for it, and that is obtained from the earthquake catalog or the earthquake earthquake precursors uh, that are there a uh, seismograph data and of course the data from the satellite either it could be an optical or a radar satellite we do some pre processing so that it can be prepared to get uh, to prepare in, in the kind of a format that is required by the different ai models and then finally you apply the different uh, ai methods it, it could be either rule based approaches for example the fuzzy approaches that is there it can be shallow uh, machine learning methods for example svm and uh, a uh, decision tree or uh, a shallow ann network and okay. finally in today in today's time uh, uh, it is uh, the the uh, uh, deep machine learning methods are used for example rnn uh, lstn cnn uh, that is used uh, for this and finally what you get an output for earthquake response is the location of the earthquake its latitudes and longitudes what is the magnitude of the earthquake that is there in any area is it magnitude 6 7 what kind of magnitude of earthquake that is affecting the area and also the time of occurrence of the earthquakes so the input layer to the uh, to the earthquake response usually uh, includes the size uh, the location which is usually the longitude the latitude because it has so uh, it will have the training data on the location the training data on the size uh the training data on on the time itself for example what are the after aftershock law parameters what are the intermittent in, intermittent intermittent time and there are also some non seismic seismicity parameters that are given for example split, uh, slip rate static static stress and all of these things and for the output layer you have the main shock size which is the magnitude itself 
uh, uh, the location of the event, for example, its lat latitude, longitude, and at what depth the event has occurred, or the or the occurrence time and the inter-event inter inter time for the earthquakes. Okay. So as you can see in this graph, so that the amount of the, the work that is being done on the application of the AI is, uh, has increased tremendously in the, in, the last, in the last 20 years or so. And uh, you see a lot of uh, papers, research papers on the application of AI for earthquake response or earthquake prediction uh, uh, is usually has an impact factor of between one and five and sometimes 10, but sometimes uh, and now, there are very high impact factors that are now also published. Uh, this is because now you have more computing power, cloud computing is there, you and also because you are collecting more data in the earthquake catalog that helps you to run such uh, deep complex uh, ENN uh, AI models. So you can see the rise in the AI for, for, for earthquake studies. Yes, and you can see here that uh, uh, how the the architecture of the AI models has also changed uh, for the different periods. For example, since 1994 to 2002, where uh, it is more of on the development side, you can see a lot of the number of units per layer were really small, and also the number of hidden layer depth was small. And the orange that shows uh, between 2003 to 2012, this has increased by some amount. But in the red, which is with a very recent period, uh, you can see that the number of uh, units per layer, that is usually the number of units in the ANN, it is from the ANN perspective, it is, uh, uh, it is, it is more or less constant at around 50 number of units. And uh, the, the number, the hidden layer depth, that is the number of uh, uh, neurons per maybe the hidden layer, uh, or, or sorry, the number of the hidden layers that are there, uh, it it uh, it also it, it varies between a, a very high number to a very low number. So you can see that how this uh, that the architecture of the AI models is being changing uh, for for the earthquakes, right? So uh, this shows that how the different people are experimenting with the different AI methods, uh, changing the architectures to understand the earthquakes. So this also shows a similar thing that earlier it used to be a multi-layer perceptrons or, 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 rad or radial basis function, which is the very sh shallow networks that were used before the year 2000. But during the year 2000, 2010, you have more deep networks, uh, for example, neural networks, uh, deep neural networks, and maybe the RNN. But now uh, in the recent time from 2010 to uh, uh, 2020, you have uh, much more complex models that are there and because and it is true because you have more availability of the data and you can see the models more complex models such as lstm cnn that are being used and now for understanding the quick response yeah so uh, the, so this shows that uh, uh, even though we are using uh, a very uh, deep networks to understand the ai uh, still, uh, the first principles and uh, the physical uh, uh, physical constraints uh, is still uh, of paramount importance. The black box nature of the A and L, its high variance can easily lead to fallacious physical interpretations. And in the recent time, there have been some publication that shows that claims that uh, they have uh, identified that how the earthquakes can be predicted using A and N and deep networks. But the same kind of performance can also be achieved with very shallow ANN networks and using uh, very simple networks. Okay, so whenever you are using AI for particularly for disaster response, one should understand that it is not always the deep networks that is uh, the answer to the question. So uh, uh, this AI for uh, 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 basically for earthquake response, this has been found that it is can can be used for on the unstructured. Uh, uh, on the unstructured waveform data instead of the structured data that is available in the catalogs. And this is one such example, which is known as the con uh, covnet earthquake. So this architecture, it is being shown that it is using uh, uh, eight convolution layers with the input from the three channel uh, waveform data. And it is trying to predict uh, uh, six clusters, which is the geographical clusters of where the earthquake might be happening. 
so this shows that uh, the ai is more uh, import, is is more suitable for the kind for the unstructured data for the unstructured wave waveform data instead of using the ai on the structured data so this is one, another thing that is uh, uh, being studied in uh, 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 for the ai for earthquake response is that uh, it is mostly suitable on the unstructured data sets so one of the limitations of uh, the the ai the methods that are used for earthquake response is the size of the training set which is required for good performance for earthquake detection and location our uh, data augmentation has enabled great performance for earthquake detection but larger catalog of located events are still needed to improve other performance so uh, because uh, now we see that the ai is more applicable for the unstructured data set so for the structured data set it is still required to collect more and more amount of that data so that ai can be applied on on that so still this field of uh, uh, application of ai for earthquake response is still developing and uh, we cannot say that uh, uh, but still the shallow networks are able to achieve the similar performance as you at you can achieve the performance with deep ai methods so still this means that a lot of training data still needs to be collected for the application of ai for earthquake response so next we move on for the ai for the flood response so here you can see that uh, the number of the ai related disasters that that happened across the whole uh, across the globe in 2017 And in, in before uh, 2000, uh, in 2017 is around 126, and between 2007 and 2016, it's around 162. So you can see that uh, uh, in the in the very recent times, the number of the flood disasters has happened uh, tremendously, and also the number of the storm events has also uh, increased uh, tremendously in the recent times. So that shows that it is equally important to understand the, about the flood disasters and how and how AI can be used for flood response. so this uh, slide is a uh, is is a busy slide but uh, it shows three things in this uh, uh, loop of the flood pathways it shows that what are the parameters that affect the flood uh, it shows that what are the uh, uh, elements that are affected by the flood and uh, uh, and what are the parameters the physical parameters that uh, influence the flood itself so here this uh, shows that uh, the complex nature of uh, how a flood event is happening what are the causes of these flood events and what are the factors to to and what are the elements that the flood is affecting so uh, this uh, again uh, highlights the point that uh, ai can be used for flood response because flood in itself is a complex problem to understand because a lot of uh, different elements are involved in 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 a flood disaster so here you can see uh, the trend since 2008 till 2017 and uh, uh, as shown in this paper that is whose reference is given at the bottom uh, you can see that the number of the articles of the research papers in using machine learning methods for flood response has increased uh, 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 tremendously and in one particular uh, method which is known as the ANN uh that has increased tremendously the one of the reasons for using ann is because it can take a lot of different data sets at different scales and from different uh, sources and still give you a reasonable uh, output that can help you to understand the flood response so this uh, slide shows you uh, the hyper resolution data that you can achieve from social media so social media is another way where you can get a lot of data sets uh and these data sets uh, can be used uh by the ai method uh, to identify the flood extent so where the flood uh is happening so hyper resolution means uh uh a uh, kind of the data that you get at a very high resolution so here you can see that uh, sometimes the people can tag their photographs and they they can show you the streets or uh, uh, or the areas where the flood has happened so the kind of the oblique view that you get from here you cannot obtain that from the nadir view of the satellites and uh, 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 neither you can fly the uavs at all the times so these are the photographs clicked by the people which are geotag that can help you to uh, 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 to test or to arrive at the evaluation of your trained ai model that is trying to identify the flood locations 
so a lot of time in uh, so now because a lot of data is already being collected about the floods uh, a lot of people tweet about floods so this data this hyper resolution data can be used from these tweets or from the different social media sources that can help you to cross set cross check or evaluate your ai models so this is another source a good source of data that that is used for ai models so here it shows that uh, the hyper resolution data or the the tweets that people do how is it related to the physical variables such as a precipitation so this shows uh, the united states where you can see in the yellow part on the left figure uh, a high rainfall amounts and the a blue part shows a lower rainfall amounts in a similar way the tweets are collected from the people that are uh, uh, that is related to the flood context and you can see the yellow part that is also on the same on uh, around the same geographical location as you can see the observed precipitation so this so this shows that these data sets that you collect from social media can actually help you to uh, to uh, correlate or to relate uh, uh, your uh, physical variables to your digital data and in that sense this uh, uh, data that you collect from the social media can help you to uh, to model or to train your uh, your ai models and one question that uh, one should uh, answer before uh, they collect the data from social media is that how ai can be used to classify tweets uh, within flood context so sometimes people use the word flood not in the context of a, where the flood is happening but in some other, another general way so uh, they should uh, so here is another application of the ai uh, which can separate uh, the uh, the tweets uh, which are uh, for the flood context and the non flood context so uh, here is another application of ai which can be used for semantic analysis of these tweets okay and then it can finally be used for the flood response so this is uh, uh, now we move on to ai for landslide response so ai are the downward and the outward movement of the slope material under the influence of gravity and you can see that there are different kinds of landslides that are there uh, such as a fall topple slide uh, there is a flow so there are different kinds of landslides that are there uh, and ai can be used for responding to these different kinds of landslides so here it, show, it it again shows the different kinds of landslides but these are actual landslides so these these landslides happened uh, after uh, the june 2013 and kedarnath flood disaster happened so you can see the different kinds of uh, the the landslides that are there uh, you can see uh, uh, planar slides are there debris slides are there and some and you can also see the rotational slide that is there and you can see one slide with a person in front of you so you can see the amount the the different uh, the scale or the uh, the different scale like that shows you how big the landslide is so uh, it is equally uh, and you can see that how much of the debris material is released by these landslides so it is important to understand these landslides and how do you respond to these landslides so uh, some of the ai methods that are used for landslide response can be broadly divided into supervised and unsupervised learning in the supervised learning you have these boostings and bagging methods but also you have a very recent methods of the rnn lstm and cnn that are applied uh, to understand the landslides it is because the landslides uh, can uh, uh, because of the data that is available uh, on the different factors that causes these landslides so we will see in the next slide what are these factors and why this uh, very complex methods uh, are used in today's time instead of using the shallow networks or, um, uh, or 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 the machine learning methods also there are these unsupervised learning methods for example the principal component analysis which is used for dimensionality reduction so here in this slide you can see uh, that there are different kind of factors for example the topographic map is there hydrological map uh, geological map seismic map uh, and some aerial photographs and uh, uh, and the dem data so you can see that there are a lot of input factors uh, that is uh, that you give to an ai model and because you have a lot of data set available for these input factors so and you do not know what kind of these factors are important and which are less important or more important maybe an expert knows a little bit more 
but then still if you have these a lot of factors and you're not aware of the features that which are important then you can use the ai model okay so here uh, either you can use a shallow network or a deep network nowadays deep networks are used because a lot of data set is available for this so this slide shows you that there are a lot of data sets input data sets that goes into the network and finally what it produces is either it produces the location of the landslides or it produces the spatial probability of where the landslide might happen okay okay so this uh, is uh, this slide basically tells you about the spatial probability of landslides so you can see here that the probability varies between 0 and 1 and it shows you that uh, the landslides are uh, really critic i i uh, is uh, the the probability of land of occurrence of landslides is really high in the higher catchment of the kedarnath instead of the lower catchment and it is based on the different kinds of this input data that was collected and uh, and it and it used a uh, a shallow machine learning method of uh, of logistic regression that was used but now because a lot of data sets are used you can even use a cnn to to arrive at the similar results or maybe better results than it. so uh, because uh, this summer school is on the remote sensing applications so a uh, two kinds of methods are used in remote sensing for segmentation either it can be a pixel based method or it, in the next slide it is the object based method so a similar thing is also applied for disaster response that the input data sets that you give to the ai models either they are pixel based that you that you uh, collect you you collect the data the different data sets for each pixel or is it is object based that you identify the different objects that have the similar characteristics in the image so either you do classification or segmentation uh, based on the uh, at the pixel level or at the object level right so uh, sometimes the pixel level is uh, is a is a good technique uh, but uh, a lot of the times uh at the pixel level you do not have the spatial or to is a spatial correlation between the features so uh, you lose that spatial uh, information and spatial knowledge because you are working at individual pixels so that is why uh, a lot of the times object based uh, classification methods are uh, are uh, preferred in place of pixel based methods and these then the data sets are prepared accordingly and input it to the ai model uh, and particularly for responding to disasters such as landslides yeah so finally uh, what we saw was that uh, there were a lot of disasters that you can study using ai there are floods there are landslides there are earthquakes uh, there are wildfires also volcanoes also but uh, because of the limitation of time uh it's best to uh, i that i showed you only disasters earthquakes floods and landslides and how ai have changed uh, uh, its characteristics since 2000 in the last 20 or 25 years and uh, the caution this i made this slide because this slide is uh, uh, important in disaster response but also is important in other uh, fields also that uh, you should be cautioned in using ai and what are these things so the first is training data so the training data is considered as the major component of the ai pipeline that is required to successfully execute machine and deep learning methods uh, uh, everyone knows that you should have uh, good training data uh, but it is equally important that how do you collect and document that training data right and how do you collect and document the training data after bias free sampling okay so you one should also uh understand the sampling techniques uh, that should uh, that one should use uh, for collection of the uh, uh, of the of the training data sets the other thing is that uh, uh, that how do you integrate the different training data sets at different resolutions so sometimes you are using uav images which is a high resolution image and sometimes you might be using a landsat image uh, which is at 30 meter resolution so how do you fuse that data together and i think in the previous talk uh, dr sham was also highlighting the point that uh, the data fusion techniques are really important and it is one of the so someone in the audience who is trying to work on the ai techniques on these remote sensing data sets and uh, uh, one day or the other you have to combine these data sets from different sensors so how do you fuse 
these different data sets is a big uh, research question that needs to be answered. And once uh, a, a, some, a few researchers have done that, and they call this as an analysis ready data, that you are, you are preparing a data set from the different dimensions, the different scales and resolutions, so that it is ready for someone to just analyze it. But to prepare that data set from different uh, sensors, it's, it, in itself, it is a problem, right? So the ARD format is free from errors. It is reprojected, regraded to match the data from the different instruments. And uh, usually the unused, unused data is usually masked out. So one should understand this data fusion techniques, which is really the, uh, uh, the need of the R, because a lot of sensors are coming up, a lot of data sets. Are coming up. Uh, OK, so here, uh, what I've done is I've tried. Uh, so, uh, so I'm writing a paper on this, uh, but that shows that how do you use AI for disaster response? So these are my thoughts uh, that uh, what one should do if it is applying AI for disaster response. So for example, you have input data sets from a natural hazard event. You have satellite data sets, you have uh, social media data sets, you have field data sets. So the first is the data fusion. How do you collate these spatial database, uh, databases? And one way is to use GIS, uh, or one of the uh, um, platforms is QGIS or ArcGIS that you can use. And once you collate these data sets, you fuse. Uh, the other thing is data cleaning and wrangling, that you do this exploratory data analysis to remove the, the data that you do not need, and you keep only the data that is, uh, that is required by you. Okay, so after you prepare these training, test, and validation data sets, uh, you either choose a pre-trained AI model, uh, for example, LXNet, Google LeanNet, and the, the different kinds of pre-trained networks that are there, or you build us an AI network from scratch by yourself. Building an AI network from scratch is difficult because you have to do a hyperparameter tuning for that. You need to tune the network architecture for your own problem, which in itself takes a lot of time. Okay, and uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, once you choose these AI models. Uh, you then move to the next part, which is the evaluation of the performance of these AI models. And the important thing is that a lot of the time I've seen a lot of the people uh, giving that uh, my overall performance of my network is 95% to 90, 90%. What they do not say is that they are showing you the overall accuracy, which is not, which is a biased metric, and it is not considered a good metric. Uh, what is your uh, 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 production accuracy. What is your the user accuracy? Uh, uh, what are your true uh, the the uh, you, we say that the devil is in the details. So one should mention that what are the false positives and false negatives, and how do you reduce these false positives and false negatives? So using the right metric to show the evaluation of your AI models is equally important. And if your results are not satisfactory, and if you are getting very low accuracy. Uh, you again need to redefine your training test and validation data sets, your AI models, your hyperparameter tuning, and you need to go again and again at this so to finally arrive at a good AI model. And finally, when you arrive at your AI model, it is equally important to document your uh, data sets as well as your model based on the FAIR principles. So this was my last slide uh, where I just wanted to share my thoughts on if you are delving into the application of AI, what you should follow and what you should not follow. So thank you for your giving uh, the lecture on this uh, AI for disaster response management.